Hey, Papa, guess what? What? I need new clothes. Baby needs new clothes. Where do you think we could go find some cool designs to, from to wear? Oh, I think I have an idea. I mean, we've got some awesome designs for people to wear. Oh, I didn't think about that. You go over to our website. What is that one again? It's um, tpublic.com slash foster care nation. Yeah, I think we got t-shirts and tank tops and hoodies and sweatshirts and baby any- onesies. They don't have any dad size onesies there, do they? Mm, I don't think so. But the baby onesies are super adorable. Yeah, they are. And we got some kids hoodies and, and short sleeve t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts. Maybe we should go over there and check it out. Where's that again? It's over at Tee Public, right? Yeah. Foster Care Nation? Yeah. T-E-E-Public.com slash Foster Care Nation. You can forget a lot of things, Foster Care Nation, but never forget this. You're listening to Unparalleled Studios. Studios. Now. Foster Care Nation, listen up. This is Foster Care and Unparalleled Training. Strength for the powerless, courage for the fearful, hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and Chaney. Because Jason and Amanda aren't going to work out today. She's off doing mommy stuff and doing, uh, I think, a therapy appointment today. We have lots of those in our house. So I know she's been gone a lot lately, guys. And I'm sorry you just had to put up with me. And that's all you're going to get. You know, I just I can't do any better because, you know, these kids need to make their appointments. And uh, and we're just going to have to go with it. So today we brought you Chaney Fletcher. Chaney is an author. And she has a uh, a book out there, Surviving and Thriving. Actually, Surviving and Thriving, we talk about. That's a book that's getting ready to come out soon, correct? That one is out. I have another one that is about to come out. I wrote them down one on top of the other and realized that I didn't remember which way. A Seed of Hope is the one that's getting ready to come out soon, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, so Surviving to Thriving... A guided journal is the one that's out there now. And um, I'll go ahead and make sure that we put a link to that in the podcast notes. And if you go to Foster Care Nation, one of the tabs there, one of them is called Book Resources. And um, full, what is it, GDP compliance, I think? Something, uh, if you're in the European Union, I've done my legal duties to say that if it's on there and it's an Amazon link, it's an affiliate link, which means it doesn't cost you anything extra. And I get like three cents if you spend $1,000. So. Um, I have some, some Amazon affiliate links up there, but all the books from people who have been on the show, I, I've tried to get them all there. So they're all kind of congregated in one place together. And we can have a huge resource for people who are going through difficult things because Cheney, you've been through some difficult things. Yes, I have. Tell us about it. Like how, how did you get involved in the foster care system, the adoption system, all of that to begin with? Well, my story is pretty unique. I entered as a teenager. I was 16. Um, I had hidden a lot for a few years, and it came to a point where I couldn't hide it anymore. Uh, My mother was an alcoholic, and she was dealing with a lot of mental health issues that she really didn't want to take care of. And so when I turned 16, she dropped me off in front of the county jail and told me to get the F out of her life. And so I walked across the parking lot to the hospital and had to call a friend's mother. And she came to me and called the police immediately. Wow. That's a new one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Dropped off. Did she think you were going to go into the county jail? She said that that's where I deserve to go. Um, She just didn't want me in her life anymore. So that's how it started. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that happened at 16 years old, right? Mm -hmm. I know a few 16 year old girls I have over the years. I've raised a couple kids. Um, 16 year olds are typically not terribly smart. I'm just going to say that out loud. I was one and I was a dummy at 16. And I'm just going to guess that most 16 year olds are not terribly mature. I'm guessing though, from the story you you, you just started with there, you've been through some things at that point, right? You probably, you probably had a lot more, um, 
knowledge and ability to, to deal with hard things than most 16 year olds did. What would that look like it, the, the first 16 years with your family? It was your dad involved? Is, is it, you know, your bio dad or how did that look like growing up to 16? My life started out pretty normal. My mom and dad were married. Um, it was really just me for a few years before they had my younger sibling. And for some reason, it just started going south between them. So they ended up getting a divorce right when I was in kindergarten. And then when I turned 11, my dad actually got diagnosed with glioblastoma, which is a terminal brain cancer. And so I had to sit there and watch him go through brain surgery three different times. And he did chemo and radiation. And, you know, ultimately, since it, it's pretty fatal, he survived fighting for a year. But at 12, I had to say goodbye to him. And that's when my mom's drinking started to really go off of the deep end. And I hit it from then until... I was 16. Wow. Okay. If there's anything that I found that's much dumber than I was at 16 was me at 11. And my ability to deal with hard things at 11 was um, pretty much zero, right? I, I think that's fair to say for, for me to say about myself at that time frame. I bet you were, especially if you hadn't gone through a whole lot of crazy hard things yet in life, man, watching your dad die from cancer. I know because I did this in my late 30s. I watched my dad um, die from cancer, and that was that was difficult for me. And I remember him. He told a few stories about his own life. Um, he didn't. He never. He was not a, an openly emotional guy. And so he'd mentioned that his dad died when he was, I think, seven. I think it's the age that when his dad died from a cancer, but um. But yeah, he never really talked about that. So as a young kid going through a hard, I mean, 11, I mean, you're stepping into the preteens and all that. So all the things that come with that middle school, right? That's a, just a bucket of fun. And you're, what did that, what, what was that like for you? What did that do to you? Well, I was already being verbally and emotionally abused at that point. Um, he had an inkling to what was going on behind the scenes since he had left the house but he didn't know how bad it was because I never opened up about it. And then when he got sick, it just wasn't on the forefront. I didn't want to have him worry about me. I mean, he had to worry about getting better. And so I didn't open up to him about it. And, you know, he sat down and had some really tough conversations with me, trying to teach me about life and you know, sharing what he had learned and things that I would need for the future because he knew that his time was running out and he wanted to make sure that he left things that I would need in the future with me, even if I didn't know that I would need them then. And so that really kind of helped get me through it is knowing that there would be an end to it one day. And having that just seed of hope is what allowed me to keep my faith in a better future. And that's what I was able to focus on. Sounds like a great title for a book. <laughs> <laughs> that seed of hope. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how well you remember those conversations with your dad, but what's the most impactful thing that, that he said to you that's really changed your life in that time? Oh, man. I don't think it was just one thing. I think it was how he carried himself. He had come from a pretty rough background as well. And he didn't let it hold him back at all. So I had that role model in him. And my mom had come from a rough background as well. But they were completely different. She kind of chose to stay the victim and she always wanted people to feel sorry for her and like she didn't have the strength to go forward. Whereas my dad sat there and took it as it happened. I learned from it. It made me stronger. I'm going to keep going and do what I want to do to be happy. 
And it opened my eyes at a young age to see that you have a choice to where you want to go in life. That's a powerful lesson. You know, there's a story I've heard run around um, that somebody, somebody who interviewed somebody who was famous told, apparently, uh, I can't remember who to attribute it to, but the story was basically this, a man was an alcoholic, um, horrible father, abusive and all the, all the horrible things in life. And he had two sons and they grew up and one became wildly wealthy and successful and the other did not. He turned out just like his dad, you know, abusive and alcoholic. And, and when they interview, you know, when somebody asked them a question, you know, why are you, why are you this way? And he said, well, with the way my dad, you know, raised us in the abuse and then the alcohol, how could I not turn out just like that? And the other son was asked the same question. He said, with the way that my dad raised us, how could I possibly turn out like that? You know, so it's such a, a telling story that having that ability to see it and just know that you can. Exactly why I share my story. I want to remind people that they can choose. And they can always choose differently, no matter how far down the path they've gone. What was your darkest moments like on that path? Well, at what point in my life as the 16 year old or as an adult when it resurfaced? Sure. Either one. Like what was the most impactful one that you look at and thought, yeah, this was, this was a breaking point where I, I had to make that choice. Oh, thinking to 16 year old me, it was probably, it was a summer day and my mother had had way too much to drink. Once again, she was looking frantically through the house for me, but she wasn't calling me by my name. She was calling me by my dad's name instead. And she knew that I hated that because he had already passed away. I was really close to him. And she knew it'd get under my skin and I could hear the anger in her voice. And I knew that I had to hide to stay safe. And my dad had given me this Cedar Hope chest before I had passed away. And I had put it in my closet and tucked it into the corner and put all of my clothes on top of it. So I knew if I needed to, I could get in that very corner of the closet, pull the clothes over me and shut the door and she wouldn't know that I was there. She never really thought to look there for me. And I remember sitting in the closet in fetal position with my knees to my chest, bawling silently and just praying to God, why am I going through this? There has to be a reason for this, but I don't understand it. I don't want to continue to go through this anymore. Just let me, you know, come to you. I want to see my dad and you, I don't want to stay and keep fighting this battle. And I just didn't really have much hope left in me at that point for a future because I thought that I would be stuck there. And I didn't want to do that to my children if I had them. I didn't want them to feel how I felt because it sucked. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Was faith a component of your childhood? I had been taken to church over the years, but it wasn't forced on me. My mom used it more as a social aspect of, you know, being a part of the mom's group or helping with the preschool to just kind of have her name up there. And I didn't really fully understand what it meant until I was in my twenties. And it's been recently that it's reappeared and it's reappeared in really strange ways for me, but just having the sense that there is someone that's bigger than I am who is in control has helped me to just let go of things instead of sitting there and just really taking it in and holding on to that. Grabbing a hold of that idea that there's something bigger than you that's in control. Man, what, what a comfort that can be for most of us to know that we don't need to be the ones in control. 
I have seen that that lack of control turn to anger and turn to addictions in so many people. I mean, and by that, I mean me as well. And it's taken me a lot of years to kind of come out of my own journey and, and begin to come to grips with that and start to go, oh, oh, wait, I see there was a reason. And I didn't know it at the time, and I was just struggling hard. You know, I, I didn't need to control all this. It's in somebody else's hands. Exactly. Yeah. That that's that was a powerful moment for me to, to get to that point. And honestly, um, you know, if you ever hear this, Joe, good old J- Uncle Joe, he knows he knows who he is. Um, he's one of the, the handful of people in my life who's been a mentor, who's helped me to see a lot of that thing because he came in with some empathy, you know, without judgment. And he knows my, he actually knows the vast majority of my story pretty dang well. And he has been such an encouraging and supporting human. And to find those people is so valuable. Did you find somebody like that to, to kind of mentor you through those moments in your life? Yes. And I have to sit there and say that it had to have been God who led me to them because my foster parents were it for me. I was an emergency placement. I got there near midnight. They really didn't want to take in a teenager. They had said no at first, but if nobody else answers, call us again and we'll take her. And they weren't expecting it to be long term. They were told, well, we're going to have court in two days and then she's probably going to go home. I ended up being there for over two years. And it was honestly probably what saved my life. A lot of people see foster care as a out to get you kind of experience. And I have seen a lot of mistakes lately, but that doesn't mean that they're all like that. And I'm very fortunate that the caseworker I got made sure that I was placed with a family that would set me on the right path to begin with. And that made the biggest difference because 12 years later from meeting them, they are mom and dad to me. My kids know them as grandma and grandpa. I was just over there Saturday to visit with them. And I wouldn't have had that if I had closed myself off or had a different caseworker who didn't care. You know, (laughs) Uh, I'll be real honest, you know, Amanda and I, we, we look forward to that day being something that can show up in our lives because we've got some, you know, we've got lots of kids in our house have come through us, uh, through foster care and some are, have been adopted. And, and there are some moments in some of those times that you're like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this was the smartest idea. I mean, let's, let's be honest. You always have those hard moments and we've had more of them over the last couple of years and that I care to admit because it's been really hard. You know, one particular kid has just been through some deep, deep struggles. And so you wonder if you'll ever get to that point or not. But, um, you know, I know that I know that when we started doing it, it was because Amanda and I both felt a calling, you know, and, and we'll both we'll put it in our own language, our own terms. There. Amanda's not doesn't have a, a deep faith. It's not something she grew up with. It's a, a struggle she has in her life. And I grew up with in a whole different world. And, and I can I can look at it that way. I go, yeah, this feels like it was a calling. Like God told me there's a place I have for you to be in this world. There's a reason you're in this world right now at this time, at this place. There's a reason why the things around you are happening the way they are. And you're just going to have to suck it up, buttercup, because uh, <laughs> there I have a job for you. And, and so that's that feels like my job. And I hope that we can get to that point with, with all of our kids to where they can look back and see it as positively as you did. So that I love to hear that you found great foster fam- family that, that stepped up and did that for you. So, you know, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, you said you showed up at, at what midnight at 16 years old in strangers houses. Like, what was that like for you? Did you know they were coming to get you? Was it kind of just a surprise middle of the night thing? What was it like for you to get pulled out? Hey there, foster care nation. We'd like to take a quick minute to step out of the podcast here and ask you guys for a little bit of support. If you could share an episode with people, friends, in a group, with family, 
anywhere where there's somebody who would like to hear this. Also, if you'd like to join us and support our mission, a couple dollars a month would be really helpful. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash foster care nation. Now back to the show. You know, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, you said you showed up at, at what midnight at 16 years old in strangers houses. Like, what was that like for you? Did you know they were coming to get you? Was it kind of just a surprise middle of the night thing? What was it like for you to get pulled out? Um, since it was after hours, this emergency caseworker that showed up with the police, she took me to the office and I nearly had to sleep in the office on the floor that night. And I remember sending up the prayer, like, please just let someone take me. I just want this to be over with. I'm exhausted. I need rest please help me get through this. And that's when she had called them the second time and they're like, yes, bring her. And so she drove me the 30 minutes that it was, it was in the same County, but on the other side. And I showed up with absolutely nothing but the clothes that I was wearing. They didn't even have a bed for me yet. They were going to get that in the morning because it was too late. And I looked at her and said, I don't care if you have a couch, I'll sleep on your couch. And so I did. And I'm still very grateful to have had a couch to sleep on that night because I could have ended up on a floor. And sometimes it's hard to realize that that really was my reality at the time. So as a 16 year old girl, you've been through your fair share of difficulties in your own family of origin, you, you know, watching the, your dad go through his, his struggles and, and losing his battle with cancer. And then all the abuse that comes with, with your home life, with your mom. Um, and then you get pulled out of the house and you're having a hard time finding a place for you. Now, I don't, I don't claim to understand women. Ladies, I want you all to hear this. I do not claim to understand women. I'm not trying to say I do, but I do know one thing. I know one thing that in that moment, the question in your mind had to have something to do with that whole, why am I not good enough? Well, unfortunately, that wasn't a question. That was an answer. It was, I'm never going to be good enough. I was pretty close to a straight A student. I didn't do any extracurricular activities. I was a bookworm. I would sit at home and just read all the time. I'd do my schoolwork. And I was very much to myself. I didn't have a social life. That was all choices that I made because of repercussions that would happen if I had chosen differently. And so I was very conditioned through the entire time of living with my mom of you're worthless. You shouldn't be here. Oh my goodness. It one of the worst ones that I had to deal with was looking at me and my sister and saying, your sister's perfect. I knew I should have aborted you. And it's just, you know, sitting there and listening to all of this over and over and over, you start believing it. And I'm now 28 and just now working through this and starting to see that none of it was true. It was stories that I was told. It's not what I believe, but it still takes a lot to try and overcome that. Yeah, yes, it does. So have you overcome that thought process yet? Have you realized that you are enough? I'm not perfect at it by any means, but I am so much better than I was just a year ago. And it's, made me realize that a year doesn't seem like a long time, but it can make such a difference. A year and a half ago, I was facing a flooded roadway that was so deep if I had driven my car into it, I probably would have died. And thinking, do I drive myself into this and end my pain from everything? Or do I turn my car around and choose myself, choose to work through this, choose to find happiness and joy and to live the life that I know I should have. And I turned around and I called a therapy place the next day. 
Um, I did intense therapy. I did EMDR as well as talk therapy twice a week. I relied on medications for a while, while I was in the very beginning to try and help stabilize me. And it was not an easy process to get through it. There were a lot of times where I couldn't function after therapy. I could just sit there. But now I am more present in my life. I get to do so many more things that I thought weren't possible. I stopped driving for two years and I'm back to driving on a daily basis. I'm getting my life back by putting in the work, but it's definitely not overnight. I want to know why. Why did you turn around? (laughs) Sometimes I ask myself that and I remember sitting there and looking and knowing that I had the choice. And I thought if I chose to drive into it, I was choosing what my mother did. And all I wanted to do was to do things differently. And I knew that just because I was that unhappy in the moment didn't mean that it would last. And I, sat there and I started envisioning a future where I was happy again. And that's the seed of hope that got me to turn around is knowing that it's not going to stay that way and knowing that so much more is to come, even though it feels like it's impossible. I wonder if your dad knew just how uh, how mighty that oak can grow from such a small seed that he planted all those years before. He definitely made an impression on me. And it's, I told my therapist all the time, I had such a secure attachment to him that that's probably one of the things that played a part in getting to where I am today because I had some form of a secure attachment to lean on, even though it had been gone for several years. And I'm not exactly sure if I would have turned around if I hadn't have had him in my life. You know, I think there's a lot of those things we'll always wonder. We don't get to know what would have been, right? But... Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get to know what was and, and even why. And it's such a beautiful thing that, that you can see how, how that connection with one solid human being in your life, one solid parent can make such a huge difference in, in your life. And so, yeah, you know, let's just sing the praises of your dad for a minute who, who, who was watching his daughter go through some stuff that he probably didn't really know and understand fully, but, but he knew enough. He knew enough. And, uh, you know, probably didn't feel like he was enough at the time because I'm a dad and I've got, I've got a couple little girls, right? And it's easy to think I don't know nearly enough. I mean, I'm supposed to know something about TikTok at this point, right? So we can connect on that front. (laughs) And uh, I'm learning, I'm learning slowly. Um, Small, as, as just a side note here, just a little bit of, you know, blatant self aggrandizement here. If you guys are on TikTok, if you look for uh, foster care nation, I think it's the title of it. Um, I've started putting a couple videos out there cause I figured out I have to, I have to get to know this platform because 97% of all conversations between me and my daughter start with, I saw this on TikTok, dad. And, I, <laughs> and at this point, I think, I think I've almost pulled a muscle in my eye rolling them so hard when she says that sometimes because it's hilarious. But, you know, I got a whole lesson about how I put trash trash bags in the trash can wrong the other day. I guess there's there's a trash bag expert on TikTok somewhere. I, I don't know. I didn't win it. But, but yeah, we, we feel as dads, we always feel so incompetent. Now, let you behind the curtain a little bit as a as a, you know, the daughter like we feel so incompetent, unable to unknowledgeable, just I don't know what the heck I'm doing here. Let me tell you, I, boys, I got right. 
they're little. You grab a hold of them, throw them across the room, bounce them off the couch, bounce them on the bed. You wrestle them. You, you throw a ball at them. They'll catch it and throw it back at you. Be careful. Eventually, they're going to throw it back harder than you do. Um, you know, but boys are pretty, we are simple creatures. Girls, yeah. they kind of mystify us. We, we don't yeah. know. I have five boys biologically, so I understand <laughs> they are much easier. And I have a bonus daughter and she is the odd one out sometimes because she wants to do all the girly stuff, but it's honestly taught my boys a lot to have her around. And so I'm really thankful for that. Now, is she the youngest? No, she's not. She is the second oldest. Uh, I was going to say if she's the youngest, she's got it quite the, uh, quite the team of protectors in years to come, but you know, they'll all get there eventually. I promise. Uh, so, you know, let's step back to, you know, back to that foster family. So you showed up in the middle of the night, you've got this whole thing coming on and I'm just going to guess you showed up with, you brought your, your stuff with you, which was nothing except for like a couple buckets of trauma to, uh, to walk into the house with. Right. And so you had that going on. What did that look like as, as you guys started to form a relationship where you were in their house and they're trying to help you? And this is not mom and dad who is telling you what you should or shouldn't do, right? I, I mean, that, there's a lot of battles that come out of that. So what, what did that look like for you guys? Did you guys hit it off immediately or, or no? In some ways, yes. In other ways, no. I was 16. I had to learn to be ultra independent and only rely on myself. And I hadn't had anyone really take care of me since I'd been 11. So I didn't know what that was like to have someone who was watching out for you, who wanted the best for you, who cared what you did. And so it was a huge adjustment as a teenager because you already think that you know it all. I remember thinking I knew it all why am I here? Just emancipate me. I'll go to school. I'll work. I'll figure it out. And so, no, we butted heads, but in that they were also my rock. Even if we did butt heads, if I were crying because something happened, she was probably the first person that would have her arms wrapped around me to comfort me. And I needed that. And so it was, kind of like tipping toe on ice at times because it's I'm a teenager and I can take care of myself but I still need you but you're not my parents and trying to walk that relationship it wasn't honestly until I was 18 and I had moved out and had my oldest that I called her and broke down and I'm like I am so sorry for everything I put you through I am so thankful for everything that you did. I understand completely now. And that's really what started our relationship. Yeah, those are the moments I think that parents wait for. I think my dad got his moment when I called him and said, you are not going to believe what I'm dealing with here. And I'm, I was unloading about what the kids were doing one day and he just starts laughing. I'm like, why are you laughing? Don't be an a-hole here. He's like, this is hilarious. He's I, this is the day that every dad waits for when you, when you get that phone call that I can sit back and go, yeah, yeah, you deserve this one. I remember why you deserve this one. <laughs> and, yeah. But you had to have that connection with, with somebody as a kid who came through the foster system and came out, you know, the numbers of, of 16 year olds who find a home and end up inside of a secure family attachment are pretty dismal for most yeah. kids. So you were definitely one of the, one of the, the few now, were you ever actually legally adopted by them or or uh, were you, did you age out of the system? So we did sit down around the table and talk about the pros and cons on if they decided to take guardianship or adopt me. And I chose to age out of foster care instead. I did not feel like I was deserving or worthy of having them to adopt me at that point. I was still listening to my mom in the back of my head saying, you know, you're the worst thing that happened to me. You're worthless. I don't know why you're here. Um, everything was my fault. It's all my responsibility to take care of her. 
and I just couldn't fathom being included in a family unit. And I didn't learn how to be a part of a family unit and accept that they love me for me until honestly this past year. Wow. Yeah, that's, that shows a lot of growth because I've sat on the front porch with a blonde haired little girl in a case you can't tell. I don't have any blonde haired children, right? That's I'm not making blonde haired kids. Um, you know, blonde haired little fair skinned girl who looks up at me and, and, and cries and says, why am I not good enough, dad? Why am I not good enough? And I can only imagine that same little girl. There's the little Cheney that sits inside that you had to, had to spend some time mothering a little bit to be able to begin to heal. Yeah. And that's what I have been working on this past year and a half is reparenting and trying to build the right neuro pathways. And it's very difficult because it's my nature to fall back on. It's my fault. It's my responsibility. I'm not worth it. I don't deserve it. And it's a daily battle to sit here and remind myself that you are worth it. You do deserve it. You're still a human. And it's taken me this long to realize that. I would show up to their family functions and feel like the outcaster. Why am I here? I'm not related. Even though they would welcome me and they loved that I was there, it wasn't until this year where I stood there and I looked around the room and I was so happy because I was like, this is my family now. I belong here. They love me. I actually get to experience this, but even better yet, my kids get to experience this. They won't know the stuff that I had to endure. And that really kind of showed how far I had really come. Oh yeah, because we don't like to hear this sometimes in our harder moments, but how much of our lives do our kids end up learning from and then repeating? And the more time you spend believing you're not worth anything, the more times you're training your kids to believe that about themselves. And how old are your boys now? So I have a 10 year old, then my girl's nine. I have a six and a five year old. And then one that is two and 11 months. Wow. (laughs) What a fun spread. What a fun, you're a busy lady, aren't you? Yes, I am. And I'm trying to, you know, build a business at home despite it all. It's fun. (laughs) I know the struggle. I know it well. Yeah, but you're training those kids to believe that they're worth it. And they're going to have the same struggle about whether or not they're actually worth it. Anyways, that's part of the human condition. I don't understand it. I haven't delved off deep enough into psychology to understand why we, so many of us, almost all of us at some point believe we're not enough. I can't figure out why everybody believes that, but you are beginning to build those neural pathways that, that don't run down that road. And that's an amazing gift you can give to your children. I hope that I honestly can break the cycle here. I don't want them to experience what I did and I've put everything that I have into making sure that they don't. I, have been through a lot with them. It's not easy. I had to leave a domestic violence situation. Uh, Their biological father isn't in their lives still. And, you know, I chose to learn from my mistakes and I chose to do what I thought honestly would impact them in the most positive way because I didn't want it to repeat. Well, it sounds like you've done, you know, after having been through a lot of hard stuff and making a couple of mistakes, you've done a lot of things right. You've chosen to learn rather than to wallow in, in the hard stuff. That's so many what people, I strive to do. <laughs> so many people forget to learn. They go, this is horrible, this is bad, and they become that, that perpetual victim cycle, which quite honestly may very well, I'm just going to guess, be part of what your mom's story was. Uh, did, does she have some of that, or was it was it act, what, like a, a diagnosed mental 
uh, mental disability or something like that? So from what I understand, she had a very rough upbringing herself. And she had been told a lot of stories that I think she had told me. She believed them and she couldn't see a different way. And so she just kind of sat there and drank away the pain and the pain kept getting worse and worse, which meant she drank more and more to try and numb it. And eventually it just... It was too much. Yeah, as a guy who, who's experienced some of that, you know, um, a fifth of whiskey a night does not make the problems leave for more than about six hours. And then you wake up and they're back. And not only are they back, but so's life and so's work and so's stressors. And yeah, it took me a while to figure out that that was not a healthy place to be either. Yeah. But we don't always have... You know, I, I try so hard not to judge my own parents on any of the stuff that, because we grew up with some stuff that, that I'm just always going to disagree with, right? Some of the things they did was were not the best practices, but also understanding if they did the best with what they had is the part that allows me to, to, to not think that my kids are going to have too much to throw back at me down the road, right? Because no matter where you start, they're going to have, they're going to find a reason why that some of their problems are there. That's part of natural progression through through life and my kids are going to have some of that they're going to look back at you know my my some of my older kids have dealt with some addiction issues and guess what they watched the dad who after we lost our daughter drank himself to bed every night they watched that and is it any wonder that that they had their own addiction issues after i modeled that for them so clearly and i look at that and go okay well i've changed my life they can see that and it's up to them to choose where to take the legacy of our family, whether or not they choose to, to continue to perpetuate that or they change, they make that as a, as a change. And fortunately me and my, my kids all have a pretty good relationship. And so I think, I think that they're going to see the the change that I've made in my life and uh, get to the point where they say, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, my oldest son has definitely gotten closer to that. And uh, that's been something, and me and my next oldest son, we were having a conversation about that just the other day. And my God, don't, sometimes we forget how much, how much just our simple actions mentor our children for how they need to live, and even if they don't like it. So just, I want to acknowledge you for realizing that at a young age, a relatively young age, because how old are you again? You're not 30 yet. No, I'm 28. 28 years old, and you figured this out. I was I was probably a decade behind you in figuring some of this stuff out in my life. <laughs> and at that age, to have gotten to that point, I mean, your brain is just now, like, fully developed, and you've already got this stuff figured out. It took me way longer, and you've made these decisions, and the, the impact it will have on your kids and the generations to come is, quite honestly, you can't even fathom the depth of those changes yet. I... I know, and I'm excited for that in a way to see what the future holds. And I will say that being a mom now and being older and having gone through and dealt with all the trauma, I have a lot of compassion and empathy for my mom. Nobody taught her how to deal with those big emotions. Nobody taught her it was okay to feel bad. No one taught her that pain was a part of life. And so she really didn't know that there was another way. And I can't fault her for that. And it's really kind of helped me heal knowing that she did the best that she could. It just looks different between our generations what that best is. There's more resources now. There's more research. There's so much more information out there that wasn't there 10 years ago when all this was going on. And I'm very thankful for that too. Oh yeah, the last decade's worth of research and information just about trauma alone has changed so much of the way that I'm that I see things, and I, I'm like, wow! I did I ever do some things stupid and wrong in the past? But it was because I was doing the best I could with the tools I had. And as it turns out, if you have a toolbox and the only thing in it's a hammer, you're gonna try and fix every problem with that hammer. Yeah, and sometimes it just doesn't work. 
Sometimes a hammer is the really wrong tool. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I tried to use it for all those other things. You know, that it's just so incredible that, that you have made this much of a change in your life and, and, um, and in the legacy of your family. I, I'm curious, do you, have you had any connection with your biological mother since you've begun to make this change? So after I aged out of foster care at 18, I did try to keep in contact with her, but it was better if we spoke once every six months. It was more of catching up with a friend and we would be excited to speak with each other. If we start talking on a weekly basis, it was really toxic again. And when I was 24, I got a phone call from my younger sibling um, who was in another state that my mom was actually in the ICU on life support. And so I drove to where they were and I had to say my goodbyes to her. Everything had caught up to her and it was, I think I was numb when it happened the most. And then it was freeing in a way because I always felt like I was her caretaker and I didn't have that responsibility anymore. You know, you mentioned that that mentality being her caretaker and I know that fairly well just from having experienced through my wife what that looks like and what that was like for her. And so <laughs> I, I kind of get that. Not fully, I'm not even going to pretend. I kind of get that. Um, but when when your mom passed, did you did you have all of your... Did you feel like you, you had everything said that you needed to say? Did you Were you at peace? I always go back and think on this. I, for me personally, yes, I had peace. But my peace looks differently. And I will be very honest and open that when she passed, we weren't on speaking terms. The last time that I had spoken to her was the last and final straw for me. I wouldn't have had her near my kids again after that. And so I was at peace with my decision because it let me heal. It let me protect my children from seeing what I had to deal with. And I knew that that was a positive thing, but I won't say it was easy. It hurt. I still wanted to pick up the phone and call my mom and have her be a mom, but she just wasn't capable of being that mom I needed. Well, I really wish Amanda had been here today because <laughs> she resonates with that story. And I don't need her here to tell me that because I, I know her well. We've talked about the deep things and and she totally has said very, very similar things to me about about her relationship with her own mother. And so that's that's super hard. Now you, you said you had a uh, had a sister, right? I do. So is how did that really did your sister get pulled out of the home as well or just you? Just me. Just you. Do you have a relationship with her still? Well, she was almost three years younger than I was. I was the oldest. And so I really tried to protect her from a lot and kept as much as I could hidden. And then when I was put in foster care, she was kind of left to fend for herself at that point. And she ended up with family. And so we ended up being raised completely different. So you have different perspectives on everything, but you add the different perspectives into we both had trauma and that meant we both had triggers. We necessarily couldn't have a conversation because we would trigger each other without even realizing that that's what was happening. I do try to have a relationship with her, but I'm not perfect at it. I don't know what's going to trigger her, what's not going to trigger her. I don't know what her experience was after I left. And so there's just so many components to trying to have a relationship with someone who is your blood, but went through something different. It's not easy. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If I'm going to be entirely transparent, you know, um, <clears throat> I have one sister that answers the phone about every third or fourth time I call her. And so we talk regularly at least twice a year, maybe. <clears throat> and then I have another sister who I haven't spoken to since we had a funeral or a wedding or something. And when I see her, you know, we'll, we're cordial and we talk, but you know, we, we had some own, some of our own struggles in our family and, uh, and that's led to some of those broken relationships as well. Ironically, I have a younger brother who I talk to pretty regular. Um, I actually think I might've seen a phone call go across my phone a few minutes ago. He'll call me and we'll just sit and BS and talk and he'll be on the road and he'll call me or vice versa. And, and we have a relationship that way. And, and my sisters will talk to him, but for whatever reason, all that weirdness gets in the way of, of our childhood stuff. And, and we just don't have that anymore. And it's really difficult. Does, do you see that bleeding into your kids anywhere or, or do they see that? So I think the younger three don't realize that I have a sister. The older three, I think, know I do, but they don't really remember. And it's, I guess, tricky to word some of this because I am always open to having a relationship with her, but I don't know what that's going to look like in the future. And so then you're tiptoeing around, well, what can I disclose that I know and what shouldn't I? And it's hard because I would love for them to know her. I would love for her to be a part of their lives. It's just difficult, especially when you add in that we live states away, so we don't get to see each other very often. We both have very separate lives where we're busy all the time. And then you throw in that I have six kids and it's hard to mesh that to really form a relationship sometimes. Oh, for sure. For sure. I get that 100%. You know, there's an old saying that says blood is thicker than water and everybody seems to think that that means that your family is more important than anything in life until you understand where it actually came from. And the the original saying was the, the, what the battle of, of, uh, or the blood of battle is thicker than the water of the womb. Yeah. I almost almost got it all wrong there. The blood of battle is thicker than the water of the womb, meaning that the ones that you stood side by side and, and, and shared in the battles with they're the ones that are closer than the people just because you share DNA with. And so what does that look like in your life? Do you have a, a, a church family or a friend group or something like that, that that's become, become a family for your own children? Well, I have my foster parents and that means that some of the other foster youth that went through there are my siblings that they know Uh, that's a pretty big family right there. And then my husband now, he has a very big family who has openly accepted all of them as well. So we have a very big family of support. Church is a little difficult. I would love to find one, but I do have a child with special needs And it's very hard to find a community that's accepting and understands, you know, what those are sometimes instead of being very judgmental and saying that it's a parent issue. (laughs) I only laugh because it's better than crying. I know exactly what you're talking about. If you look up in a DSM-5, if you look up ADHD, my little one's picture is there. I'm going to tell you, he's like the perfect example. Um, he's headed off to therapy. Actually, he's probably in therapy at this very moment. And, and we've come across something that we go, huh, I think this might be part of it. Talk to the, you know, talk to the therapist about this before they get started. She's like, I can't even pronounce it. I'm like, here, let me, let me send you a voice note so you can say the word for her. Just play it for her because, you know, she found this, this deal and we went, huh, this looks really familiar in her life. And so, you know, we're, we're working with a therapist through that kind of stuff, but the general public does not, we're at a place where mental health is much more accepted to be an, un, something yeah. to, to work through as adults. We've still not gotten to the point where we're willing to look at kids who are acting out, misbehaving, acting a fool, whatever you want to call it, and realize yeah. that some of that's men, children's mental health. 
Right. And I guess for me, it was an eye opener when my oldest was diagnosed with ADHD. And then we got a diagnosis of autism on top of that. And it's hard because you have this child that can't control impulses at all. There's nothing there to help him control what he's going to do. And then you have this lack of communication with it. And it just is difficult some days to navigate that, especially as he gets older and people don't understand that he looks perfectly healthy, perfectly normal, but that he's not sometimes. Well, I want to give you the best worst advice I ever got about that because we've got a couple of kids. We, one particularly struggled mightily with some of his, his situations. And I was talking through it with a, a group of guys that I know. And, and the one guy says, you know, God put that kid there for a reason. And I'm like, don't you dare simplify it down to that. That's not enough for me. I, I don't know that he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like the simplicity of that answer. It just, it feels like, no, I want more. I want to, I want to know how to fix it. I want to fix him. And I think, I think I'm being told it's not my job to fix him. Right. It's your job to accept him. That's what I have learned. I don't try to fix him at all. I've accepted where he is and, in being able to accept it, it puts, all of my perspectives in order to where it's not about me at all. It's about him. What's going to work for him? How is it going to work out to where I'm teaching him to be functional and responsible and take care of himself when I'm not around one day? And that's what's helped me is just knowing that it's completely okay with who he is, but we still have to teach him how to function. Let me ask you this. I've had the moment, as most men have, at some point where I, I'm talking to a kid about something and all of a sudden my mouth opens and my dad's voice comes out. And I'm like, I just, I just, no, that was my dad talking. That wasn't me. Have you had any of those moments? Because, you know, some of your, some of your childhood voices were not kind and not healthy. Is that something you've had to struggle your way through? I honestly don't yell that much because I don't like confirmation. But having five boys, it gets loud sometimes. So I've had to learn in the past few years how to yell to get attention and stop the chaos and then direct what they need to do to try and tame it. But that's much different than what I grew up with. That's more, okay, I see you, I hear you. Yes, it's fun, but we need to do this instead and redirecting it. And that's worked pretty well. Um, there are times where I've said phrases that I remember my mom saying to me and saying those phrases, it's like, oh, I remember being told this all the time. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, I am like my mom. I do have similarities with her, but I'm not her. I didn't make the same choices that she did. And so it's those little similarities of catching myself saying, you know, don't do that again. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. Of course, that signals a memory of being told the same thing. It's like, oh, I'm a mom. I, I get to embrace that. And if it's not something that I like, I get to change that. And that's kind of where I've just decided to go with it. Well, Janie, it looks like, or it sounds like to me, that you have figured out how to take a lot of those life lessons and truly learn from them and change who you want to be. Change some of those lessons, all while retaining some of the stuff that may have actually been the good that, that came out of your childhood. Because no matter how bad it was, there's usually a little bit of good in there somewhere, and you've held on to some of that, but worked really hard, it sounds, to remove the, the bad stuff. Yeah, I have. And I would tell you that, that, you know, hopefully your kids are grateful for that. But I know those ages and they don't know what gratitude is yet, do they? I don't know. Some of them do, but it's not an adult form of gratitude. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I know the struggle. I know that they'll find it eventually, trust me. Um, let's see, CJ, our oldest, was probably 21 the first time when he accidentally said, thanks for raising me right, you know. <laughs> he didn't say it exactly that way, but that's what he meant. And it was right after basic training, so I can't really actually repeat how he put it without having to mark this as an explicit <laughs> episode because... <laughs> Basic training will teach you lots of lots of ways to curse, and and it was it was like the like the backhanded compliment thing. But I think at that moment, my wife and I looked at each other. It was like, okay, that was that moment where we went. Oh, I think he's gonna make it. <laughs> like he recognized it. You know, he's still yeah. done plenty of stupid stuff after that. He's done plenty of stupid stuff after that, and caused himself some headaches and issues. And he's walking through it. But that's that's what we do as young adults, right? That's how I see it. I mean, my early 20s was all about making mistakes and trying to learn how to do things because I wasn't taught. But by making those mistakes, I learned and changed and I've gotten to where I am and I have dreams of where I want to be one day and we'll see if I can get there. Oh, I think you're going to get there. I'm still working on writing my first book and I have like two or three partially started and i think i have two or three more written in my head that i haven't even put on paper yet and trust me you got there way before i did you're already working on the second one you got one published already so i'm pretty certain that sounds to me like a, like a woman who's going to to get to her dreams well that's my goal <laughs> <laughs> and if not if not you make it as far along that path as you can because I got a feeling like we end up where God wants us to be at the end anyways, if we're willing to listen and follow the directions that, that we have in front of us. So saying that's a, that's a tough thing for us to do, but, and except sometimes that we might not get to exactly where we want to be. We usually get to where we need to be. That, and sometimes it's the journey that counts more than where we end up. I don't know if it's sometimes. I think that's all the time because Lord knows every time I get where I think I want to be, it's not, I don't get the big win that I thought I had coming. It's just, yeah. it's, it's the, the first step on another journey. Right. So, yeah. Well, Cheney, I really want to thank you for coming in here and telling your story today because you have one of those difficult stories that, that most people don't tell. And then you ended up in foster care and it turned around and it went right. You did the right things as far as a 16 year old kid could figure out what was right. And you worked your way through and you're raising six kids. Now you're writing books. You're letting people know what you went through and trying to change the world. People like you are what we need. So thank you for being an authentically positive part of society. That's going to help this world. Thank you. I, I needed to hear that. <laughs> okay. Foster care nation. Thank you for listening to Cheney's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. Be sure to come back next week. We have new episodes every Tuesday. If you'd like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at Jason at fostercarenation.com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash fostercareuj. And don't forget, we have an account over at Buy Me A Coffee. It's like a virtual tip jar where you can help us fund our mission for as much or as little as you want. It's at buymeacoffee.com slash fostercare. The links to everything are in the show notes in your podcast player or at fostercarenation.com. And as always, you are so super awesome. I thank you guys. So cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Unparalleled oh Studios. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hit stop on a couple buttons here.